Thanks for joining in to another edition of the CFF Sites preseason preview series. Today, we're going to focus on the Big 12 and independence. And as we as he has uh, through the first couple of shows, I'm joined by my partner, Mike Bainbridge. We're going to we're going to get through all of these conferences probably within a week. Get them up there on the site. Mike, we're talking Big 12 and independence today. We're giving everybody a two for one, although not many to touch on in independence. But Nonetheless, we'll have some questions for each program. Anything to get into before we jump into the uh, Big 12? No, just uh, excited to talk some football. We had, as uh, we posted on the Discord, Fresno State, New Mexico State, they're starting fall camp, so ready to talk some football. Well, look, this could be the last time we talk about the Big 12 as we know it, right? I mean, I know it's going to be some time before they can kind of get all the red tape done with Texas and Oklahoma, but you know, nowadays with the way things move as fast as they, uh, as they do, we don't know where we'll stand a year from now. So maybe, who knows, this could be the last time we're talking about Oklahoma and Texas in the Big 12. Still a lot to be determined between now and next year, though. Yep, let's roll. Let's roll, man. Let's get into it. So as usual, as we've done for the first two episodes in the AAC and the ACC, we've gone in reverse order of last year's standings. Nothing different here. We're going to start with the bottom feeders, Kansas Jayhawks. Lance Leopold coming over from Buffalo. What's the big question going into the season, Mike, that you're looking for in preseason camp? Yeah, I think for those that read my uh, names to know articles for the Big 12, when I listed out top sleeper, top play, uh, top dynasty pick, it was all a running back. And that's obviously what we're, we're focused on with the new uh, coaching staff at Kansas. And I'm admittedly a bit conflicted as to how to project um, Kansas running backs, not only who's going to start, but how productive will they be initially? If you went, if you looked back at Buffalo in that first season um, that that coaching staff was around, you know, their top two running backs ran for 1600 yards, but they were also returning a 1400 yard rusher from that prior year. So kind of, they already had an established running back in place. Don't have that at Kansas. They are returning five starters along the offensive line but they were putrid last year. Um, so it's not a good group, even if it's returning five starters. I know they added a, a Notre Dame transfer. Um, they added a, a transfer from Buffalo um, where Leipold was. And uh, I think he was an all Mac performer. So those guys should help, but how quickly will, you know, that group gel and how quickly will they, they get that offensive system up and running? I'm not sure. I don't think it's going to be in year one. So I'm not sure that a Kansas running back is going to be ultimately productive, you know, from a, a fantasy standpoint this year, but um, you know, moving forward, we want to know who that starting running back will be. They got a couple options, Dalton Gardner, um, Amori Pisa Kixon, uh, a former Michigan transfer. I know Phil Steele listed him as the starter. He's a big guy, 220 pounds. Um, and then obviously the new, the new hotness with uh, with Devin Neal, the, the highly touted recruit. So a couple of guys in the mix. I'm not sure it's going to happen year one, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, I think the one thing with Leopold coming over, we know what identity he's going to try to establish, right? The question is, is how quickly can they be effective uh, in their implementation, right? So to your point, my question is the same thing, running backs. There's a lot of guys there. Uh, this was a question that we looked at with, with some of the programs like at South Florida and Temple when we did the AAC show. This may be a situation where, Mike, it takes a couple of weeks for things to kind of get ironed out before a guy really jumps to the forefront. Maybe we're looking at a second half of the season running back that emerges out of this group. And I think, you know, kind of what you just said in, in the summarize, you know, maybe this is more of a dynasty look, right, than, you know, a redraft for 2021. So we may find a spot start here and there, like we mentioned, when there's a bunch of guys, maybe injuries can kind of uh, take effect a little bit and, and dwindle down your selections, and maybe you get a spot starter here and there throughout the year. But I'm on board with you. It's all about that running game. It's about, the, you know, that we know the identity they're going to try to establish, but how effective can they be in year one? Remember, you talked about Leopold's success in year one in the MAC. I happen to think the MAC is the worst conference in college football, and I think it will be a little bit of a different story in Big Twelve. And so I think we're we're uh, we're we're pretty much in lock locked in on the same thing there with Kansas. Moving down to Baylor, though, um, 
what are we looking at with the Bears? Because uh, a lot of question marks, we, you know, we could go to a few different places here. Where's your number one spot? Is it quarterback? Uh, yeah, it's quarterback. Um, you know, I, it was an afterthought to me. I know a couple of guys in our group chat or one guy in our group chat is touting, touting the Baylor quarterback as a potential option. Um, Jerry Bohannon, just because of, uh, he's a running quarterback and they have a really soft, uh, first three games of the schedule. I, you know, maybe a, a, a spot starter, but I'm not going to use any draft capital on, on Bohannon as, as a, a guy that once, Baylor gets into uh, into Big 12 play, you're most likely going to end up cutting them in the first place. So not going to use any draft capital on them. Maybe I'll pick them up the waiver if I need a, a spot start. But um, I mean, he's not even guaranteed to, to get the job at this point. He's still in a battle uh, with um, Jacob Zeno um, and then uh, the true freshman Cairo Drones, who I'm really high on for not this year, but he should be uh, their starter down the line in a year or two. But yeah, I, I, I know Bohannon's a, a really good runner, not so much a thrower, but, um, you know, I was looking back, the new OC um, who came over from BYU, and he never had a quarterback that went over 100 carries in a season. So I'm not, while Bohannon's skill set says he's going to run quite a bit, I'm not certain that he's going to see like then extensive volume on the ground. So, I mean, I'm, I'm curious as to who the starting quarterback can be. Maybe they're an early option, like early in the season, but I'm not spending draft capital on that. Yeah, I, I'm with you. Uh, I don't know if there's really any player that I particularly like about Baylor going into the season. I think I'm going to probably be keeping tabs a little bit more on the backfield as well. I know you've got Tristan Ebner right there. You've got a back that has potential to catch 25 to 30 passes, right? And so if he can get a few touches, you know, a few more touches in the running game, for me, he might be someone that you would target in maybe some type of a Big 12 only type league. But I'm really curious to see how they work the backs there with Craig Williams, Quaylen uh, Quaylen Jones, and then Tristan Ebner for me. Uh, I'll be curious to see how that backfield unfolds and plays out because I do think that Ebner has some receiving ability out the backfield. And I'm curious to see if he can get any additional workload in the running game. Then again, we're looking for that. You know, that's not something we're paying attention to in preseason camp, right? I mean, that, those are things we're going to kind of find out through the first couple of weeks of the season. Sure. And just to add on to that real quick, um, you know, they, uh, a senior linebacker, Abram Smith, remember moved over to running back. And I think he's being projected into that top two with, with Ebner. Um, so maybe a guy that, that pops in this new offensive system, doubt it, of course, but, um, just a name to, to remember and keep on your radar. There you go. Moving over to Texas tech, Mike. So we talked about a guy coming over transfers, coming in Tyler Shug coming over from Oregon transfer. Now the, uh, projected starter at talk Texas tech is what's your question going into camp with the uh, red Raiders. Yeah. I I'm interested to see how the wide receiver rotations kind of play out. I know that during big 12 media days, when Matt Wells was talking, he mentioned that Kalon Geiger is going to play outside. I don't really see that. Um, I mean, he played slot the entire time he was at Troy, or for the most part, at least most of last year. Um, and, you know, they got a lot of uh, younger, unproven talent, but they got a lot of talent at that, that wide receiver position with um, Eric Ezekanma. Um, He sounds like he'll be ready week one. Um, and then they got a bunch of just tall, lanky, fast freshmen or redshirt freshmen, J.J. Sparkman, Jaron Bradley. Um, so and those guys will kind of be battling for that second outside spot opposite as but I'm just curious to see how those rotations play out because, um, they got a lot of guys, but I'm not sure who's the surefire starters outside of as Yeah. And that's why for me, I think the biggest question is, is how established, how quickly can Tyler Shug get in there and just establish himself as the surefire quarterback one. I think he'll be given every benefit of the doubt to be the starter. And to your point, there are so many options in the passing game, maybe in addition to um, as a comma, do we really, you know, do we really know where to look right now at that wide receiver two, wide receiver three spot? So for me, the big question I think is uh, just kind of all eyes on Shug the, in the preseason. And, and if he went, you know, if he nails down that job, 
for me, he's the most intriguing option because, and sometimes I like when there's not a true fire, true sure fire uh, bet at wide receiver one, because I think that actually helps the quarterback out with his progressions. He does it. He's not locked into one guy. So uh, maybe, maybe that's a plus for him. We'll see how that plays out, but definitely eyes on receiver. And then for me, locked in on Shug's progress at quarterback as well. Uh, yeah, just, going, to, and, uh, just to cap that off on Ezukanma, I just looked it up. His is we both project him as wide receiver one. Yeah. He's going. I don't have the exact rounds, but his ADP is sitting at wide receiver fifty, and that's a. Uh, uh, I think we both agree a guy that does have one thousand yard upside. They're not Texas Tech's not going to run a true air raid, but they're going to implement some some air raid concepts with the new OC. So um, you can get Ezukanma at a yeah. very cheap rate right now. And that's a good point because remember last year, Keyshawn Carter was uh, frequently targeted in that offense and, ta- and he's gone now he's at Houston. So, uh, you know, a lot of the reliable, you know, there's not many reliable targets uh, there that, that, you know, that have proven to put up big numbers. So you're right. And, and he's going pretty late in drafts, you know, great value with where he's going, particularly if he ends up being that sure bet number one wide receiver. Yeah, and just a lot of options that, to your point, should help out Chuck in the passing game. So it benefits him as well. Absolutely. Uh, going over to, let's move over to Kansas State. Um, what's, your, what's your question for the Wildcats program going into preseason camp as we move into 2021? Yeah, I want to see how the, the kind of how uh, Kansas State divvies up the carries now because um, they got the two backs, what is it, Joe Irvin and Jacardia Wright. Those guys are, they opted out last year. They're both back in the fold now. And I think we all understand that Deuce Vaughn is not ever going to be a 200 plus carry guy. Maybe he believes that, but I don't think that that's realistic that he will be um, kind of that workhorse running back. And that's not what the system has done over the last few years. So I'm really curious to see um, how they divvy up those carries. I mean, we know the quarterback's also going to be involved. Skylar Thompson's going to get his share. So I'm just like Deuce, Ra- Deuce Vaughn is def- a definite regression candidate for me. Just he averaged, I think, eight yards per touch last season. I don't think, I mean, maybe it happens, but I don't think that that number is sustainable. So um, if you just, if the, if you see regression with his numbers, plus now more guys in that backfield, they're going to get carries potentially. Um, I, it's, he's, uh, I think, and I've mentioned this too on the Discord. I think Deuce Vaughn is a better uh, best ball format running back than he is a redraft, just because some of his predicting his breakout performances was really tough last year. So I'm uh, just a lot of factors that I'd probably rather have Vaughn um, as a best ball candidate. Yeah, so we're in 100% complete agreement on that. I mean, I know in all the all the drafts that we've partic- participated in together, I don't I don't have Deuce Vaughn. I don't remember you drafting Deuce Vaughn. Do you have any shares of him? Uh, and I'm with you. I, I actually think that he's a guy that's going above where I have him going before where I have him valued right now. I th- I'm I think you're spot on. For me, he's a regression candidate. I look at his yards per touch average last year, and I wonder if he can duplicate that. I have my concerns on doing that. And you're right. This is a Kansas State offense that is run heavy. He's not someone that's going to pound it between, you know, he's not built to pound it between the tackles, right? You're you know, if we think back to last year, I know a guy that I was high on in projecting was Jacardia Wright. Maybe I was a year early on him. We'll see. I'm really hopeful that, that you know, I, I that's where my question going into camp for me is, who's going to emerge as that second back for Kansas State? Because given the size and stature of Deuce Vaughn, there's probably going to be a bigger back that's going to assert himself. And then you start to wonder if that bigger back then becomes the vulture in short yardage and goal line situations, right? Which then we're talking about regression for Deuce Vaughn. That plays right into the formula. So you and I are spot on with that. And uh, that's what I'll be looking for too. How that running back two, maybe even possibly three uh, develops in that backfield. Well, yeah. I mean, I was going to say, in addition to right, you'll also get Tom, uh, Thompson that's going to put potentially vultures yep. and carries in the red zone, but then, you do the flip side of the coin and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they, they were returning zero starters last year along the offensive line. They get all five back this year. So you can look at the positives and the negatives. with Yeah. Here's something to that, Mike, here's something that we never really talked about though. And I'll touch on this because 
we, we put a lot of stock into returning offensive linemen every year, and it makes a major difference sometimes for these programs, right? The one thing we have to keep in mind, too, is that we also have to keep in mind for as many programs that are returning three, four, five starters up front on offense, there are just as many defenses returning their starters on defense too. So it's going to be interesting to see how that experience really plays out. I think it may factor in more for schools in the like SEC, the Big Ten, some of the bigger power conferences that lost a lot of guys. Curious to see how it really affects the, the, the mid-majors and some of, the, some of these other conferences like the Big 12 and Pac-12 as well. Sure. Another point on that is Kansas State, uh, let's see, they graded poorly in both run and pass blocking, according to Pro Football Focus, and they were 111th in line yard. So that also kind of speaks to um, just a general point with all these offensive lines that are returning three, four, five starters. You know, we'll see obvious year to year progression, but they weren't any good last year. So yeah. it is, is returning five starters a huge deal? But, but here's the thing, though. Here's the thing with Kansas State. We have to give them sometimes the benefit of the doubt, right? It's the system. We know the system is a run heavy system. They get blocking on track this year. That's going to be a productive running game. The question is going to be where are the carries coming, right? We could have the same argument about Wisconsin. We could turn talk about turnover at linemen. We could talk about turnover at running back, but we know what we're getting at Wisconsin. And so sometimes, and this is the conversations that we have when we're not here, uh, you know, recording sometimes, sometimes you have to play those historical systems too and take those into account, right? Yep. Let's go over to West Virginia, Mike. I'm curious to see where your question is for the Mountaineers um, going into preseason camp. What do, you, what, do you, what do you have your eyes on there? Yeah, this is actually a dynasty question. I, I, I want to know who is the next man up after Letty Brown because um, we, we don't know at this point. And that's why I'm so high on Letty Brown this year is because there isn't a solidified running back to there. I think the returnees from last year have 21 career carries and you never really just in reading articles about West Virginia, you don't hear them as kind of standing out in practices. So my eyes are on the incoming true freshman, in particular four star Jalen Anderson, who I would project probably to be the running back one or in that conversation next year in 2022. Uh, I wanna see how he does in camp. Uh, I was pretty impressed with his film uh, 200 plus pounds. Um, he, um, they lined him up all over the place in the Wildcats and, and in the slot at receiver. So he can do all those things that, that Letty Brown does because he's obviously a really good runner and pass catcher. Um, so, and I want to see if he makes a, a step forward in, in fall camp this year to maybe even take over that running back two job where when Letty graduates after the season, then he can step in as that running back one for next year, which is in a proven system like West Virginia. So I'll be keeping my eye on him. Well, the one thing we have to realize too is Neil Brown inherited most of this roster too, right? And so he's playing with the hand that he's dealt. And Letty Brown, let, you know, this is something that, you know, if you go into our preseason uh, draft guide and look at the back, uh, the industry best ball drafts that we've done, all four of them, the top 25 ADP is in there. Uh, I was curious to see how far Letty Brown has actually dropped in some of our drafts. Um, I'm just really, he's the one player that jumps out at me that I cannot believe is going as low as he goes because the, really the offense is built around him right now. You're looking at a running back. That's probably going to catch 30 passes. You're looking at a, you know, thousand yard back. That's probably going to go over 200 plus carries, right? I mean, he's, he's going to carry that offense. And so for me, Two things I'm really looking for. One, the major question for me is just the health of Letty Brown. I just want him to get to the season healthy. And if he does, I think he's going to prove to be a top 10 fantasy back this year. No question about that. I'm locked in on him. I know you're locked in on him. It doesn't seem like a lot of other people in our drafts are locked in on him. But that's a great thing for a lot of you people that are drafting because uh, you're probably you're right now you can get Letty Brown in, in second, third round. And right now, Mike and I have him as a top 10 running fantasy running back going into this year. But I'm curious, once Letty Brown gets out of West Virginia, if that offense starts to evolve a little bit under Neil Brown and they start putting the air in the ball a little bit more, I'm really curious to see that. But I don't think we're going to get that this year, Mike. I think you're right. 
who who develops behind Letty Brown is going to be the key to what we're looking for. And really getting Letty Brown into the season healthy, I think, is what I'm going to be watching for more than anything else until we get to that point. Yeah, Letty accounted for 60%. I don't know where that stands nationally. Uh, I, it has to be top five amongst running backs. He was 60% of the volume share last year. Um, I, I mean, maybe Jalen Anderson or the other backs don't. I, I mean, as a Letty Brown owner in many leagues, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that that nobody kind of takes that step forward and he sees that similar, similar workload. Um, but yeah, you can get him late second round, early third round, and he's a top five back in my opinion. So I think we have this conversation on a yearly basis too. Why is, why is a player like Letty Brown slipping, right? And just, I think to put it in, in simple terms is people get bored of these, these, you know, multi-year seniors that, that they want that B. John Robinson, right? That, that new hotness or what, if you want to call it that, right? And I think you can get a, a, a good deal on somebody like Letty Brown who could very easily outperform a, a Bijan or a Tank Bigsby or, or it's a great point. someone like that. It's a great point. Everybody's always looking for the shiny new penny when they've got proven right there in their back pocket and they just don't even know, right? Uh, let's go down to TCU, Mike. Uh, Horn Frogs. I know you're a big fan of Max Duggan this year. Uh, what's your question going into preseason camp here? Yeah, it's on Duggan. And I would, I, in my opinion, this is the best set of skill possess. <laughs> There's a tongue twister. The best set of skill positions that T, uh, players that TCU has had in quite some time. We love the receiving core with Quentin Johnston, um, Tay Barber. Um, obviously, people are high on, on, on uh, Zach Evans this year. Uh, the offensive line is expected to be improved. So I'm really looking to see if Duggan is taking those next steps um, in, in his progression uh, this fall camp, because I mean, he, he made strides even last year. I, I wrote down a couple of stats here. Um, if I can find them on the page, but let's see his overall uh, pro football focus grade jumped from 67 to 79. Uh, I know his uh, completion percentage jumped five to six points last year. Um, his intermediate passing between 10 and 19 yards, um, that average, um, that accuracy jumped as well from 19.7% to 41.2%. So you see these, these incremental improvements in his game. Now you get a full off season. He's not going through heart surgery like he did a year ago, right? So, and, and, and then, as I mentioned previously, just a bona fide wide receiver one in Johnston a really talented running back. I think he is set for a, a monster year. Yeah. Um, I'm looking for, I'm looking at running back and you know what? Uh, Zach Evans for me is the thing. The, I, I want to see what happens at running back, you know, running back by committee has been a common theme most recently under Patterson. I look at Zach Evans, Mike, and I think I might be undervaluing him this year. I know, uh, you know, he certainly has a lot of buzz, right now and when I look at that backfield I think man Zach Evans is just the most talented back that they have in there and I'm curious will we see him run for a thousand yards this year because here's my take on Zach Evans if he gets enough work and a heavy enough load that he goes over a thousand I think he crushes a thousand like he's either going to be the clear one or we're really going to see a clear committee approach. I don't think there's no in-between. So for me, I think you're looking at a seven, 800-yard Zach Evans or a 1,200-yard Zach Evans. So for me, I'm really curious to see how that backfield plays out and the reports we're getting out of camp because Zach Evans, to me, is probably the one back in the last three or four years at TCU where I think we could see a you know a, a maybe maybe 200 plus carries if he if he's that you know he's that talented the question is whether or not they're going to give him that type of workload i i agree with you we should be looking out for that i am a heavy lean towards it is still going to be a committee backfield deandre miller is a talented player he's going to step in now as the running back too i know they like him and that gary patterson's stubborn um, in his ways. So I, I think he is set on a rotation and Duggan's going to be involved in that as well. So if, if we're setting an over under on a thousand, I would bet the under. Um, but that's just how the T. Well, that's where we came in on the projections, right? We came in around eight something on Zach Evans, which, I, which feels about right. I think that's where we landed with Zach Evans. But like I said, 
I'm really curious how it plays out because if he does have a thousand yard potential, I think he's going well over a thousand. So I think it's, it's all or nothing with him. It's either committee or running back one clear cut. Um, like you said, that's going to take a couple of games to clear out, but I know that Zach Evans has the talent to do it. You know, you do too. Just depends on his Patterson. Is he going to give him that type of a workload? We'll see. Uh-oh, next door. Let's go to Texas, Mike. Brings a smile to your face here. Uh, what's your question going? And, and I say this, uh, I'll preface this for all of you guys that, that don't know a lot of the, the vaccine texts that go on. Um, we have a lot of conversations about Texas, a lot about Bijan Robinson and his fantasy potential this year. There are some naysayers out there amongst our group. Uh, Mike steadily backs Bijan, and I'm with him. There's a lot of us out there. Um, but what's your question for the Longhorns going in, into uh, preseason camp here? Yeah, I'm 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 done arguing the Bijan Robinson takes. Well, there's um, no question there for us, so I don't have a question about running back. Do you? No, no I'm I'm curious how the quarterback position is going to. There we go. Um, I don't think it's ultimately going to matter this year in terms of just fantasy production wise, which one they choose. Um, just kind of looking back over Sark's uh, coaching career, I pretty much settled on uh, com in comparison his first year at Washington. I think he averaged or his starting QB, I think it was Jake Locker at the time. I think averaged about 233 yards per game, uh, had 21 touchdowns, uh, you know, did, did some things on the grounds, but he did it that Washington team in his first year never had a bona fide wide receiver one either. So that's kind of the comparison that I'm leaning towards uh, when I did my projections for Washington, which or uh, for Texas and the Longhorns, um, because as I think you're going to talk about, they don't, I have major question marks about their wide receiver core. I don't think anybody's, you know, going to emerge as the guy this year. Um, and they have multiple uh, projected starters that um, that are injury prone, right? So um, I think that's going to hurt the uh, quarterback production as well. I'm just curious as to how Sark is going to play this because if he ultimately chooses Casey Thompson, well, is Hudson Card gone after that? Is he going right. to transfer out? But then if he names Card, is Thompson going to ship out? Because then he's got no shot at starting being. Well, it's an interesting point. And that's why my question is at wide receiver, right? So we got our eyes on quarterback. we got our eyes on receiver. I mean, whether you want to talk Jordan Whittington, Troy Amore, uh, Joshua Moore, you've got the new kid coming in, Xavier Worthy, right? And so there's no, we don't have an idea right now of who is going to be wide receiver one. And I have to tell you, you know, historically, whenever these situations play out, I always tend to lean with the young guy because to your point, you know, unless Sark really messes up the messes it up bad, he's getting a mulligan in year one. He's got, this is the year for him to figure it out. So is this where he goes card make Xavier worthy, that number one target coming in, if the kid can kind of hold his weight and really start planning for 2022 um, I think that's an interesting point because from what we've heard and seen right now, O'Meary, Whittington, Moore, there's nothing there to, to really kind of hang your hat on. So I think the young kids got just as good of a chance to come in and make an impact, um, you know, this season as, as, as any of them. So I'm kind of curious to see how that plays out in, in preseason camp, because where, where coaches tend to play, you know, they tend to be quite, you know, a little coy with the quarterback leading up to week one. That's not necessarily the case at wide receiver. Usually in camp, we we're probably going to get some good tidbits on who's running with the first team at receiver. Yep. And I mean, all the, all the buzz has been about worthy this summer that he's been impressing. Now he's got tremendous speed. So anybody with tremendous speed is typically going to look good against air you know, right. Or, or against defenders without pads. Right. So, um, you know, but the buzz has been unworthy. I, obviously he was a Michigan commit. So I, I, I know, I know him from, you know, back in the earlier in the winter months, just kind of looking at him disappointed. He ended up with Texas, but um, yeah, should benefit him in the long run. I would assume it benefits anybody to not go to Michigan. <laughs> we'll get there, Mike. We're not to the big 10 yet. <laughs> <laughs> Oklahoma State Cowboys preseason camp uh you know Spencer Sanders comes back at quarterback right but you know um 
questions all over at receiver and at running back going into this uh, going into the new year, right? Yeah, I'm curious if the last two games from Spencer Sanders last year was kind of a precursor of, of what to expect moving forward. Now, this is probably one of my biggest misses last year, and we've all had them in doing it for this long, but projecting Spencer Sanders as a, a top 10 quarterback last year obviously didn't pan out, but there was, there was um, you know, reasons as to why that occurred, mostly due to injury, right? And I, and I looked it up. In the six of the seven games that he played last year, he topped 300 total yards, okay? Maybe the touchdowns weren't always there, but, but he's putting up the yardage um, that's, that's necessary for this offense to succeed. Um, you know, all the, I mean, it could be coach speak, but they're all talking up Sanders again this year saying he's, he's made improvements as a quarterback, just as a, as a quarterback kind of reading the field, understanding the offensive scheme you know, all the, all the little things that, that a quarterback needs. So, um, you know, he topped 300 yards in the last two games last year and looked really good in the bowl game. So um, I'm curious if we do see that step forward from him in that uh, third year progression. Yeah. I, I think for me, it's going to be the, the, you know, who's going to emerge as that wide receiver one r- running back one. I know, I mean, you've got names there, LD Brown, Desmond Jackson, Jalen Warren, a transfer from Utah state. You've got Dominic Richardson, this offense to me just is not a committee. You know, Gundy's just com- to me never been much of a committee guy. I don't think it's going to happen right away, but I'm curious to see if one of these guys really does emerge himself as sort of like the, the you know, whether it's LD Brown for this year or whether it's the running back for the next couple of years. I'm curious to see if there's a guy that 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 kind of just makes a name for himself and establishes himself as a running back one. And then, you know, we're high on Brennan Presley, right? But as of right now, we're, we're seeing him more as a slot guy, and we know that traditionally the slot receiver position isn't necessarily the high, uh, you know, a high fantasy impact player. It can be. Uh, it has in the past, but it's been quite a few years since we've seen that, and we're kind of curious to see who's going to be that outside receiver. Would it be someone uh, like Tay Martin? Would it be Jaden Bray? Um, you know, I, th- that's where the questions for me lie in going into preseason camp here. Yeah, uh, just to speak on the running backs real quick. I, I know we have LD Brown projected the highest. Um, he is the starter coming out of spring, but I would place heavy money that that he does not finish the year as a starter. And I agree. You made a point that that Gundy, you know, typically prefers in recent history a workhorse, but that hasn't always been the case, right? And they got. They got four relatively capable capable guys in that backfield. I would not be surprised if that is just a committee the entire year. Um, and then one final point I wanted to make on Spencer Sanders, his his ADP right now is QB forty six. Okay, you can get him very late, and I think we would both agree, and our projections would say so, that he he can easily surpass that 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 threshold of QB forty six. And we've seen it in the past where where a guy can uh, under Gundy ends up as a top 10 quarterback. So while I don't think either of us project that to happen or think it'll happen, uh, it's it's not out of the realm of possibility. Well, you, you make an interesting point because here's some questions we've gotten on the discord, right? Sometimes the rankings, our rankings don't necessarily correlate or match up with what the projections say. And there's a simple explanation of that, right? It, sometimes the projections are higher when there than where we have the players ranked. We, at that point, the, we just don't necessarily trust in our gut what our projections come out, you know, at that particular point. But then there are some players where, we rank higher than where the projections spit them out. So we don't rank players and then just put a number to them, right? We have our our formulas that we use. That's what comes out. The way we rank is basically off of what, what, you know, we take the projections, we take what our feelings are, what we have, you know, our gut feels, and then we adjust accordingly. So you're right. Spencer Sanders right now is one of those guys that I think we actually have ranked a little bit lower than where his projections come out, but you're right. He's also a guy that could easily exceed projections, uh, you know, where we, where we have him right now. And to your point, great value with where he's going in drafts right now, particularly compared to where he was going last year, right? Because of my ranking, probably. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, I wasn't low on him last year. I wasn't super high, but I mean, Hey, 
Um, the, the talent's there. The question is, is, can they put it together and can the pieces come together um, on the offense this year? We'll see. Let's hop over to Oklahoma, though, in state. We'll stay in the state of Oklahoma and go from Oklahoma State to Oklahoma. What's your questions for the Sooners going into the 2021 season? Yeah, I want I want to know what Marvin Mims's usage rates are going to be. And, and I think we know how good of a player he is. And I'm curious if Lincoln Riley knows how good of a player he is because – he didn't play all that much last year. He, uh, let's see if I have it here. I think he, I can't find it real, real off the, off the page here right now, but, but he in snaps run amongst uh, Oklahoma receivers last year um, when clearly he was the best player on the, uh, amongst the receivers, best player on the field for them. So, so why is, was he not playing more is, is my, my question. And, do I think we're going to get an answer from that from Lincoln Riley? I, I doubt it. Um, but I'm curious to see if he's going to see the field more, because if you're looking back over the years, Oklahoma has typically fielded a 1000 yard receiver. I think they had uh, at least one from 2014 to 2019. So if he's on the field more 60, 70% on the top of the time, I think we're both confident that he can reach that yeah. mark and his top 10 ranking, which we both have, but if he sticks at, at, at um, you know, 40% usage rate, then, then he's not going to hit that mark and he's going to be a bust. Yeah, well, I agree. Um, and I think we're, we're confident that he's going to be that wide receiver one, but until we get, you know, confirmation on, on that and see it on the field, um, you know, I mean, that's why we do projections, right? But we try to, you know, do as much as we can, take the information we're given with the information we, we read and research. So I agree with you there. My, the question for me is, how will the, the, the hype, the performance of Eric Gray in the spring affect the utilization of Kennedy Brooks and how much utilization as a running back two, if you could call it, will he be running back two or will it be more of a one A, one B? Remember when Sermon and Brooks were there, right? I think, didn't they both go over a thousand yards together? So you're looking at a former 1000 yard back in Kennedy Brooks right now that is going extremely low in drafts because of the hype and buzz that Eric Gray generated in the spring. So for me, that's where, that's where my eyes on is, is, you know, now don't get me wrong. Kennedy Brooks did remember he opted out last year, right? So he didn't play last year. And sometimes when you take a year off, uh, you know, whether or not he bounces back and gets right back into it remains to be seen from a talent standpoint, I'm all about Gray, right? Um, but I'm curious to see how much Kennedy Brooks will get used maybe in that, in that two spot and take some of that, um, take some of, uh, you know, take some of the fantasy value away from Eric Gray. That's, that's where my question is going into the new season. Yeah. I, I, I don't know about you, but I don't, I haven't gotten a single share in our best balls of, of Eric Gray, just because of, I don't think Lincoln Riley is just going to, going to kick a senior former 1000 yard rusher to the curb. Right. And I just, I think it, you have more potential of a split backfield there with Brooks and gray um, than gray hitting 250 touches. You do. But my argument and my point to my rankings is that I feel the upside and the ceiling is much higher for gray. You'd probably agree with that. Um, and that's, pro that's more, that's why we have Eric Gray ranked higher than Kennedy Brooks. Uh, but Brooks has a, you know, he's got a nice floor. I, you know, I wouldn't call him a boom or bust running back. I just think Gray, the reason why I have him ranked much higher than Brooks is I just like his, I think he's got a higher ceiling. Let's go down to Iowa state. <clears throat> One more, Mike, Iowa state. Now we're going to end with the cyclones here. Um, not a lot of questions for me with the Cyclones. I, I, I found one, but what, what, you, what, what are your eyes on going into preseason camp? Yeah, this is another dynasty question for me. I want to see who is that running back two that could take over for Brees Hall next year because uh, of any coaching staffs in the country, I think we trust Matt Campbell to find that next great, you know, 1,000 yard, you know, top 10 running back in fantasy football. So Brees Hall is going to be gone after this year. Um, you know, people forget that uh, Jairo Brock was was a higher rated recruit than Brees Hall when when they both came into to school. It was just that Brock suffered an injury, I believe, in spring camp, which kind of set him back. And then that, you know, the story is written from there that Brees Hall took off after that. But 
you know, Brock was was highly higher rated on on 24/7. So, and it, it just reading some of the quotes, the coaches are talking about that he's done everything, you know, possible these last you know 12 months to to get his body and in shape and and you know just kind of the nuances of the the running back position. So if he looks good um, this year. Uh, then, then, then you have that next 1,000 yard running back at, at Iowa State, and um, that's somebody you can get real cheap. Of the dynasty drafts that I've done, he is either going late or not selected at all. Um, so uh, that's some guy that you might want to make a trade for in your dynasty leagues. Yeah, it's a good point. You know, you and I have spoken about Iowa State a lot. Uh, Charlie Kolar, tight end, Xavier Hutchinson. Um, you know, more than likely the top receiver there. They've got Brees Hall back, Brock Purdy. There's not a lot of questions as long as they help, as long as they stay healthy. Uh, we both have Hall up there in our rankings. Um, he's my outside player that may be a non-quarterback to win the Heisman Trophy this year. And from a fantasy standpoint, I've said this a number of times. I don't know if I've ever said it on one of the shows, but uh, I think you're going to look at, I think you could be looking at just as productive of a season for Brees Hall this year as you had last year. And I, but it, you know, there's a caveat to that. I think Brees Hall, as long as Iowa state is in contention for the big 12 title, then you're going to see the B Brees Hall that you saw last year. The only concern you should have as a Brees Hall owner is if Iowa state happens to lose two or three games, they're out of running for the big 12 championship. And then to your point, Mike, I think, I think there you're going to see Brees Hall's carries go down. You're going to see a number two running back worked in there. We'll probably know the guy at that particular point. But I think Hall's workload you know, uh, will depend on how far the Cyclones go into the season with being in contention for a Big 12 title. And look, there's not a lot of questions for them on offense, and that's a good sign. So I think you're probably looking at an Iowa State team that should stay in contention in the big 12 for most of the year. Yeah. And, and we've talked about this offline and we don't have to, you know, do a deep dive in here. It's Friday. We want to get out of here, but um, you know, we talked about this offline, uh, you know, Brock Purdy's his, I just looked it up. His yards or his attempts per game dropped by six last year. So while we do think that uh, Brees Hall's workload should main, remain relatively similar um, you know, I know you spoke about Iowa State being in contention, and, th and that's how Brees Hall's um, workload remains in that range. Well, what if, what if Brock Purdy's numbers reflect uh, more in what 2019, where he's averaging 36 passing attempts per game as opposed to 30? So just just adding a different dynamic yeah. um, into that conversation of how how his how Brees Hall's uh, workload could fluctuate. It definitely does play a factor, and that's why, and we talked about this on a previous show, the better the team, you know, two years ago was Iowa State as good as they were last year. I'd argue that they weren't, right? And so when you have an Iowa State team that's on the, uh, you know, on the, on the better side of, of the scoreboard late in games, what are they going to be doing? They're going to be running it out, right? Whereas two years ago, they playing a little catch up here or there, and they needed to air it out a little bit more. So that, that's what I'm saying. I, I think the scoreboard ultimately uh, with these systems and maybe Iowa State is a true indica you know, indicator of that. Uh, the scoreboard may dictate whether or not we see a, a better fantasy Brock Purdy this year or um, and a less effective Bro uh, um, uh, Brees Hall or vice versa. Right. So maybe maybe that maybe the you know, I like to target guys and backs on teams that are really good, which is, and I'm sure it's going to come up in, in later shows with some of the teams that have good backs, but their offenses are just terrible. And the question is, well, are they still going to be pounding the rock in the middle of the fourth quarter and win it down by 21 points? And the answer is probably no. So uh, I think Hall probably does benefit by Iowa State, uh, you know, being in the in the lead in some games late in the fourth quarter. And as a, as a Brees Hall owner, maybe you just don't want them to be up by four touchdowns because then they'll turn to the to the number two back, right? 
So here we go. That does it for the Big 12, Mike. But, but you know, this is one of those episodes where we're going to knock out two and one. We're going to go right into the independents here. I think these are going to be pretty straightforward. We'll probably get through most of them pretty quickly. So let's kind of start with some of the bottom, bottom feeders, in, you know, independents. Let's start with UMass. Any, any quite, what are you looking for, for the, from the Minutemen going into preseason camp? Uh, I want to know how many players on the teams that I've drafted already have UMass on their schedule because that's all I care about is that terrible defense that UMass has and how many times that my players on my team are going to face them, right? So I think, let's see, I looked it up prior to the show. Bill Connolly of ESPN, he has them projected to be the worst defense in FBS this year. Uh, You know, you can debate Phil Steele um, all you want, but his his projections are calling for 42 points, 0.8 points per game allowed this year from the Minutemen. So um, if you have guys that are going to be facing them this year, get them in your lineup. And, and if, if we want to talk, oh, yeah. go ahead. No, go ahead. No, finish that. No, I was just going to say, if we want to focus on a, on a player on, on UMass that we could be looking at, it would be K-Ron Adams, right? Because uh, two years ago, you know, same system, Walt Bell is our head coach. Uh, I think the running back one ran for 800 yards and seven touchdowns. Um, so, you know, that's nothing spectacular, but that's a guy that could potentially be on your Well, roster. you know, here's, here's the thing. Um, you know, we're going to talk about this probably a few times. UMass is a team that probably has four matchups on the schedule where you may get a good matchup to, as a spot starter, Right. I know in our G5 league and one of our leagues, I took uh, the guy for me is Trey Petway at wide receiver. Cause I think UMass is going to be throwing the ball almost all the time, even late in games. Right. So uh, I think Karon Adams, Trey Petway, those are the two players I'm watching. UMass has about four spots on their schedule where you're probably going to get something out of them. They're probably going to be waiver guys. Um, but you're right, man. You, you know, you look at the schedule and it's like, who, which players do I have on my roster plays UMass and which ro- players do I have on my roster plays UConn? So we'll go there next. I mean, let's go right into UConn because I mean, really, does it really matter? It's just a different color Jersey. Yeah. I, I, mine was more of a kind of big picture question. Not, not really just about their roster in particular, but um, I want to know what a team looks like sitting out a year coming off a year where they didn't play due to the pandemic. Right. I think the most recent uh, uh, comparison that we could use is maybe UAB when they were, when they eliminated the football program. Yeah. And then I look back, they finished eight and five that year in, in 2017. So, um, but I probably trust Bill Clark more than Randy Edsel as a, as a college football coach. Right. So I don't think, uh, you know, eight and five UConn is, is happening this year, but you know, we don't have any precedent as to, as to what a, a football team looks like after sitting out a year, at least in, in recent memory. So, um, you know, I was just kind of looking it up before the show and they were just in the media day, they were talking about how the, the roster is in better shape, whether guys are putting on, you know, lean muscle or, or, or cutting weight or, you know, doing whatever to, to better your body. But so it sounds like the roster is in better physical shape, whether that translates to wins or not this year, I don't know, but um, you know, that's just a bigger picture question. I don't know what to expect from UConn this year. Well, you surely gave them a lot of airtime. <laughs> um, you know, for me, look, there's two fantasy assets that I do think are worth investing in. Kevin Mensa, thousand yard rusher. He's going to get it. He should get a heavy workload. And then you have Cameron Ross, which you and I have actually agree on this, um, you know, late value. Um, yeah, but he's going really late in drafts as a late round value pick. Um, he's going to see a lot of, you know, he's going to see a high volume of targets uh, or should in that offense. And so, uh, you know, for me, that's really it. Uh, there's really no questions in there. Like you said, it's more of a long-term deal, but just, you know, Kevin Mensa, Cameron Ross, after a year off, are they going to be able to just kind of jump back in where they left off? Now let's go to a program that may even be worse than these two, Mike. I, I probably, you probably could guess it. It's going to be New Mexico State, right? Let's talk about the Aggies. Um, see how much airtime yeah, you give these guys because I'm <laughs> curious to see what your question is for them. Yes, I have a very serious question about New Mexico State. Can I get my $100 refunded from when they got blown out, shellacked, whatever, by freaking Tarleton State back in, in February? I thought that was the lock of the century. 
You're facing a D3 team that was coming up to the D2 level, multiple starters out doing, due to COVID, and you get absolutely housed. I think they were like out gained 400 yards to like 150 yards. Um, and, and all honestly, I don't care much about New Mexico State this year. I know they've put some of their guys have put up good numbers in the past, right? Their running backs are used in the passing game, uh, you know, high volume passers, but I don't. I'm still I'm still frustrated losing that hundred dollars back in back in February. Well, uh, the, you know the question for me is I, I'll and I I remember that that was that was that was a I remember laughing about that one. Um, You're down by four touchdowns in the first half. <laughs> they, I believe they I well I I believe they play Alabama this year, right? <laughs> um, that could get ugly. I mean. Maybe the fourth teamers for Alabama play in that game. But, you know, for me, you know, there'll be a matchup or two. Um, last year, going into the season, before before New Mexico State pushed their season back to the spring, Omari Samuels, the Michigan transfer, we were he was kind of one of a sleeper pick for me going into the season before everything got pushed back. Um, but the one thing that really jumped out to you and I, because we had a chance to watch New Mexico State in the spring, was just how much they used Juwan Price out of the backfield, right? Um, I'm curious to see what happens at running back there. Uh, is Samuels, you know, he's got to be still in the mix there. But, you know, Juwan Price may be in some type of a deep, full FBS league. If he does what he did in the spring, could be, you know, does have some value with maybe in some PPR leagues. Uh, in in really deep FBS leagues. Yeah, just to, just to add on to that, between 2014 and 2019, the running back one averaged 37 receptions in that time span. So, um, and I think- Good old Larry Rose the third was a big well, chunk of that, right? There you go, yeah. I mean, we, we both kind of watched New Mexico State on Twitch <laughs> in <Right>. February. <laughs> and, you know, we liked what we saw from Price. And then, you know, looking back, uh, to last year at this time, Amori Samuels was, they said he was the best player on the team during, during camp. So, um, you know, they're, they're both, they look to be talented back. So a late round PPR option, perhaps. Well, you know, it, 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 that's something we'll have to keep an eye on. Maybe, maybe that's what we need to look for in spring camp, Mike, because if price was that effective and Amari Samuels was that good for a program like New Mexico state, they've got to find a way to get both of those guys on the field. At the same time, maybe maybe they shift price to something like maybe to some type of slot receiver. They run two back sets. Who knows? I'd be curious. But a team like that, they've got to get their best. They've got to get their talented players on the field. Well, yeah. And then we say, you know, price was effective while well, he was effective. Playing against, Tarleton State. Well, Dixie State. Right. <laughs> Another, yeah. Yeah. There you go. I mean, it, all right. Well, let's go. Let's go. Let's go over to Army, Mike. Let's let's jump there. Let's kind of. Uh, you know, we'll go into Army. We still got Army, Liberty, and BYU. So now we're, we're, we're talking about the better independent programs now. So any questions going into the new season with Army? Yeah, I want to know who starts at fullback or the, the B-back position. Um, you know, I kind of mentioned this when I discussed the, the academies and their triple options, how they differ in a bit of as to who's going to be the most productive player, where if you look back at Navy, they center around the quarterback in the rushing game. Well, Army spreads it around a little bit more, but it's typically their fullback or their B-back that, that um, will lead the team. I think they've had 10 rushing touchdowns in the last five seasons. So somebody will be productive back there. Uh, they bring back J Jacoby Buchanan, who looks to be the projected starter as of now. Um, you know, Phil Steele, I think, threw a, a wrench into there, naming Tyson Riley as his projected starter. I have no clue who that is, but, you know, you just kind of, take notice of that and, and put somebody on your radar. So, I mean, if, if, if a fullback is getting 10 touchdowns a year, we should figure out who that's going to be. Yeah, that's a good point. And that, my question is, is none different than that. Obviously the wide receivers are null and void in the army. So, um, you know, I'm going to go straight to Liberty and kick things off because I've got nothing new with army. And so for me, my question with Liberty, yours may be different is, uh, I just really want to know if there's going to be a sure bet number one wide receiver. You know, when we're sitting there doing projections, you know, we've got DJ Stubbs, we've got Noah Frith, you've got Kevin Shaw, you've got the transfers, Austin Amakin coming in from North Texas. You've got JJ Holloman that came over from, uh, from FIU. Tons of receivers there and some size there as well. But 
you know, um, you know, obviously Malik will is going overall number one in every fantasy draft that, that I've had and hosted so far this year. Um, and maybe, maybe the fact that there is no true number one, because we talked about this earlier on another team, uh, does benefit the quarterback because he can then just spray it all around the yard, right? But, man, if that offense, if there's a surefire number one wide receiver, we're overlooking somebody in a lot of our fantasy drafts right now, aren't we? Because when it comes to Liberty receivers, they're all being taken in the last few rounds of every draft that we're doing right now, right? If at all. So I, I, looking back to last year, so they returned six of their top seven pass catchers and nobody had over 16% of the target share. So, and I think their leading guy, DJ Stubbs had 47 targets, right? So that's just, it's not somebody that's going to be effective in, in college fantasy. So I don't think, you know, they added Holloman. Um, I mean, it's his third stop in college. I don't expect, maybe surprises happen, but I don't expect him to just all of a sudden become the wide receiver one there. Um, I think we're just going to get the same and, and, and it's just going to be spread around. Yep. So uh, any other questions for, in addition to that? Nope. That was my question for Liberty. Let's go to BYU then, man. Let's end it. Let's end it with the Cougars. Now we know, uh, you know, new quarterback coming into play is, is, is that where you're going with this one? Yeah, um, it's it's quarterback, and I just think it's quarterback just because it affects everybody in that offense, right? If if the new quarterback, whoever that ends up being, isn't isn't as he's not going to be as productive, we don't think as as Zach Wilson, right, right, or was last year. But if if he's just if he's not up to standards or not up to par how does that affect the rest of the offense? Does the running game suffer because of that? Do we see, I'm already projecting regression from Isaac Rex, their star tight end. Um, if, if their quarterback isn't, their quarterback play isn't, isn't good enough, then, then how far does he drop down the, the rankings? Yeah. And, you know, they have a really talented wide receiver core. You know, uh, does anybody emerge there? I don't know. How does the quarterback support that wide receiver core? Is anybody going to be um, you know, valuable in college fantasy. So it does center around the quarterback. Um, I think we both agree it's Jaron Hall as of right now. I think he gives the best or most upside just because of his legs. Um, you know, he showed that in his, in his brief stints a couple of years ago. I think he ran for about 80 yards against South Florida in his one start, but um, still up in the air at this point. Well, it's a good point. I mean, look, there's enough returning at receiver and there's enough that they have uh, in the cupboard that, that, you know, it's not bare. They have talent there, right? You've got Rex coming back. You've got just about the entire backfield coming back, including Tyler Algier. Um, it, the, it's all eyes on a quarterback for me, you know, one, and I'll finish this point since, since we're talking about BYU and they're the last team to do on this show. Um, you know, we, a lot of kind of debate a little bit between you and I about Tyler Algier, you know, he was a player that I kind of moved up, moved down, moved up, moved down, really had to kind of do some thinking on that. Um, you know, he, he had an, a really good yards per carry average last year. Right. Um, so you would think much like we were talking about Deuce Vaughn, I would think that he's coming down a little bit on his yards per carry average this year, but he did not have, I think of all the backs, and I forget the number it was, um, I think he barely topped 150 carry mark. So we have to realize, even though Algiers' average may come down, BYU's offense may not be, we're, we're expecting BYU's offense to regress a little bit too, right? And so there were some games last year where BYU were blowing out a bunch of their opponents. And so there was no need for Algier to really have carries late in games too. But even though Algier's carries may come down, even though his yards per carry average may come down this year, because they're breaking in a new quarterback, remember Zach Wilson is gone they may need him more in a volume output this year. He may see his carries increase, even though his yards per carry come down, which is the reason why I still like Tyler Algier as a running back this year. And I think he's a guy that's probably going a little bit lower where I think he, you could get value for him. And uh, you know, I think he's a nice mid round value in fantasy drafts right now. Yeah. Just, just, uh, just, Adding to that, I, I was reading up on them before this, and and there seems to be conf they have turnover on the offensive line, but they seem confident in their starters that it should be a really good offensive line again. So 
Um, any regression that he has probably won't be due to the offensive line. And then um, at 220 pounds, Algier reportedly, he said during BYU media days, ran a 439 40 yard dash or somewhere in between that 439 4 4 range. I guess it's kind of a wide range for a 40 yard dash, but that's still really good for a 220 pound back. So, um, yeah, I think you can get him later than than he should be going in drafts and could be a nice value for you yeah i think it's a good point and you know he you know he, matter of fact I, I, and i'll take this straight from the guide reading it um he was one of 14 players last year to run for a thousand yards in the fbs um he him and jared paris patterson were the only two to reach that milestone on 150 or fewer carries he averaged seven five uh seven point five yards per carry last year so yeah, I mean, if he, he, he should, because we're probably going to see a little bit of regression in that BYU offense, wouldn't be surprised to see him get over that 150 carry, 150 carry mark this year. So where he comes down a little bit on his yards per carry average, he, make up, may, 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 uh, he may make up for that in his volume. So, Mike, that's going to do it, man. We've knocked two more out. We've got Big 12 and Independence out of the way. We've got a few more Are to go to. Notre Dame? What's oh wait 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 I forgot about Notre Dame boy our, our Irish fans are gonna crush us I thought that was it how about we that? have five or six in the Discord they're gonna they're gonna rip you for that put that on the bloopers reel huh <laughs> so anyway yeah let's let's get into Irish man I should have ended I mean as a Michigan guys. fan I'm completely fine with dismissing Notre Dame <laughs> from one I think yeah, just, yeah let's talk wow about it. wow so what's your questions for the Irish going into the new season man. Yeah, I want to know kind of what the offensive line is going to look like because if if we were basing it solely off the spring game, you know, after losing four starters, they're in for a rough year because they're not going to be as proficient passing the football with Jack Cohn now. So they need that running game to step up. So they're losing four starters now. They I think they were dealing with some injuries back in the spring game. So some of their projected starters didn't play that day. They added... Um, Kane Madden, a Marshall transfer, who was probably their, the herd's best lineman last year. So that should help. Um, but I just want to see if, if any offensive line struggles keep coming up during fall camp, because um, they need that running game to be there uh, with Tyron Williams and, and Chris Tyree, because we don't, we're not, I assume you agree, we're not confident at all that that passing game is going to be any good this year yeah I think I think if you were if you were not you or I were to guess the top question fantasy wise from what the what we've heard or gotten feedback from it would probably be the concern of whether or not Chris Tyree is going to take some carries away from Kyron Williams this year but my biggest question is is that wide receiver one for Notre Dame is Kevin Austin going to step up and be that guy this year? Because that, you know, much like we mentioned with Liberty, you know, Kevin Austin is a guy that, you know, is going extremely late in a lot of our drafts. You're probably looking I, the, the safest bet of side, you know, in the passing game for Notre Dame right now is going to be Michael Mayer, the tight end. Right. So uh, curious to see who really establishes themselves as a true wide receiver one, if they have one. Uh, my bet is on Kevin Austin. I, I think he's going to be that wide receiver one. I'm projecting that to happen. But, um, you know, he's not up there in my rankings, but he is a guy that you could get very late in drafts if you want to take a shot and maybe put your faith in, in Kevin Austin that he establishes himself as that wide receiver one for me. That's the big question because we know with Notre Dame what we're going to get, you know, their identity, they're going to run the ball. The question is, you know, how good will Kyron Williams be this year? Will Chris Tyree take away some fantasy value from him? But to me, the hidden gem right now in Notre Dame might be whoever turns out to be the wide receiver one in that passing game. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I believe Kevin Austin is the most talented of the group, but you know, we haven't seen it. He's been injured. Um, so he needs to prove that during fall camp. Uh, just, I think the tight end one there is probably going to be, end up being their, their leading pass catcher, but I'm interested, you know, and you kind of mentioned it, we're a little bit concerned of how Chris Tyree dips into Kyron Williams uh, workload. Um, it could be a moot point just in the sense that if with the questions at wide receiver that they're going to use Kyron Williams 
all over the field because he proved that he's a capable pass catcher last year. And I think Tommy Reese, the offensive coordinator, talked about during the spring how they're going to move him all over the place. So while I'm concerned that Chris Tyree dips into his, his rushing volume, maybe he makes up for that as a pass catcher because of uh, the question marks at, at wide receiver that Notre Dame has. Yeah. Well, for all you Notre Dame fans out there, we got you. I got you. Um, no, uh, look, that was that, 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 that's fun, Mike. Uh, you know, it's funny. Why, why does Notre Dame always get, why are they the brunt of all the jokes all the time? I mean, don't you get enough with Michigan? So, I mean, I mean, you get your fair share with Michigan, don't you? Every single day. <laughs> well, look, Mike, that's going to do it, man. Uh, anything you know, want, you want to put a bow on this for the big 12 independence or, or you think we've got it all? No, I'm ready to hit the lake and hit the weekend. <laughs> well, there you go, man. So look, Thanks for joining in. Uh, that's going to do it for another show for this preseason preview series. We've got the Big 12 independents out of the way. Uh, we're going to get these up for the weekend. And then, you know, Mike and I are going to uh, we're going to find a way to get back here in the studio and get the rest of these shows knocked out and, and hopefully have them up for you guys by the end of next week. We actually uh, I just put links in the back of the preseason fantasy draft guide as well. We have the new. Uh, the, the fourth best ball results results posted in the back of that. And then the last page uh, you'll have for all of you that are accessing uh, the, the preseason fantasy draft guide on your computers, on your handheld devices, you'll have the, the links at the end of that PDF device to catch, to catch up on these shows as well. So that's going to do it for this one. We'll see you guys on the next episode.